All right. <laughs> All right. right. And as the numbers continue to climb, um, as folks join us, we'll go ahead and dive in. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose. We're live with Jonathan Myberg and Anson Mount discussing A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life, An Epic Journey of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey. You can follow the link posted in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. Before we start, we do want to sincerely thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this event. An enthralling account of a modern voyage of discovery, readers meet the clever social birds of prey called Caracaras, which puzzle Darwin, fascinate modern day falconers, and carry secrets of our planet's deep past in their family history. In 1997, Jonathan Myberg received a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship to travel to remote communities around the world, a year-long journey that sparked his enduring fascination with islands, birds, and the deep history of the living world. Since then, he's written reviews, features, and interviews for print and online publications, including The Believer, The Talk House, and The Appendix on subjects ranging from a hidden exhibit hall at the American Museum of Natural History to the last long form interview with author Peter Matheson. And he's best known as a leader of the band Shearwater, whose albums and performances have often been praised by NPR, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Pitchfork. He lives in Central Texas. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Myberg in conversation with Anson Mount. Thank you both. All right. Um, Anson, we, we, we need to cover your bio, first of all. I mean, Anson, for <laughs> some of you, some of you may know, is, uh, is far more famous than me. He's um, uh, famous, in, uh, famous in my in my living room. <laughs> um, the Anson and I have known each other since our, our college days. And uh, I remember having a the tiny bit part in the production of The Grapes of Wrath, where you were playing Tom Joad and you walked on. I had to say that we've got a law against vagrants. <laughs> but, Never through a word spoken. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, since then, Anson's gone on to have a, a fabulously successful acting career and is now most famous for his uh, roles in Hell on Wheels and in uh, Star Trek Discovery and, and now the new series Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I have to say that if you, uh, if you had told me when I was 14 that I was going to be interviewed by the captain of the USS Enterprise, I'd have died and gone to heaven. <laughs> So thank you for doing this, Anson. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you that I'm not Patrick Stewart or James <laughs> William James. I don't know if I could get in a word, edge, get a word in edgewise with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> well, you know, Jonathan, it just occurred to me that the last time you and I uh, appeared together pro publicly, you were covered in mud head to toe. That's, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a, there was a, there, we were chained together, or no, I, I was, no, that was a Jim Jarmusch movie. I was chained to a tree, an oak yeah. tree, and you were covered head to toe in mud. That's right. Uh, and uh, <laughs> had purple hair people, then too. Trusting our friend Brannon, who uh, would subject us to his experimental films in college. And uh, we, we've somehow managed to survive that and go on to be creative in our, in our own ways. And, uh, you know, I, I, it also occurs to me that in college, I was responsible for, uh, even way, way before you were ever into birds, I was responsible for entirely different reasons for giving you the nickname Birdie. Yeah, and, which I thought was uh, weird at the time. Huh? Which I thought was kind of weird at the time. And, and uh, then later on, it became, it, it was prophetic. Well, I, I feel like I should, uh, after reading this book, I should apologize to you uh, for perhaps cursing you. I forgive you. <laughs> yeah, after <laughs> 20 some odd years uh, churning out this book, uh, finally, wow, what a weight it must be off your shoulders. Yeah, it's, it's been almost a 25 year journey from the first moment that I met Australia at Caracara to, to this week. And for we, your friends as well, we've, <laughs> we have been- Yeah, you've all been subjected to it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, I, I, I've been, I've been, I was really uh, honored to be able to read it early because uh, I've been, I've been chopping at the bit to, to get at it. And it's not surprisingly a beautifully written book that I think 
flows like a well-wrought science documentary. And, and you know, you, you tackle a many faceted history to get at this thing, a genealogical, geographical, taxidermic, and, and through existing literature. But really you, you set the book up as a, a kind of a mystery novel. Mm -hmm. it, can, you, can you explain to, to our, uh, our viewers right now what the central mystery is for you in this book? Yeah, when when I first when I, I the fellowship that Julie mentioned at the at the top was that I received after college is called the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, and it's a, a really interesting fellowship because it it funds students who've just graduated from college to pursue a, a project that they design themselves in one or more non-U.S. countries that they've never been to before. And my project that I the twenty one year old version of me pitched was about studying community life at the ends of the earth which for me just meant kind of looking at a map and going, well, that looks really far away. And I'd, I'd never left the Southeastern United States at that point. So uh, the Falklands was one of the places that I picked. And I went there because it seemed like a, a really isolated human community, which it is. But I hadn't realized what, how important it was for wildlife and how special it was. I had a vague idea that you could see penguins there, which sounded interesting to me. But when I went to a place to see some penguins, I was confronted by these weird sort of hawk, hawkish looking birds. It looked like a combination of a hawk and a crow. And they came right up to me and just stared at me. Um, sort of like, what are you doing here? You know, as if they had the same right to be here that I did. And they, uh, one of them took a pen from me. Um, they, they were just, they were so bold and so curious and so charismatic that they kind of they just really made an impression on me. I wasn't interested in birds that much at that point at all. But then a few weeks later, uh, still in the islands, I met a British ornithologist named Robin Woods, who was about to do a survey of the outermost islands of the Falklands, which the Falklands are much larger in terms of number of islands archipelago than most people realize. They have, they're about 800 islands in the Falklands. Most wow. of them are very, very tiny. But the outermost islands preserve this very old, very wild, version of that landscape um, that's predator free and it's just it's home to millions of seabirds uh, and to uh, the largest breeding population of these caracaras which are the one thing that surprised me was that uh, darwin was also interested in these birds he visited the islands in 1833 in the, in the earliest days of his voyage on board the beagle when it's important to remember he was just a kid and if you walked in the room Right now, he just looked like an undergraduate. He was 21 years old. He uh, was kind of a rich kid with a future as a country priest ahead of him, but he had an interest in beetles and in uh, geology. And he saw this, this trip as a, as a chance to see parts of the world that nobody with an interest in natural history had really gotten to look at very much at that point. And he was brought along not because he was some uh, you know, famous naturalist, but because the captain um, really wanted a companion uh, because the, the job of the beagle was not to, uh, to look for, uh, being a naturalist, was, having a naturalist along was not really the, uh, the stated mission of the beagle. The beagle was doing a survey mission in the Southern South America. And the captain was worried because the uh, previous captain of the ship had committed suicide in that very region. And so he wanted a companion um, that he could talk to. Uh, so Darwin ended up being brought along as a kind of official buddy for Captain Fitzroy. And I actually have, can I, can I share this picture that I've got? Yeah. Of, there's one contemporary illustration um, of Darwin aboard the Beagle. This is it here. And it was uh, made by an artist named Augustus Earle. And uh, you can see Darwin in the middle of the picture there with Captain Fitzroy next to him. And all around him, there are people bringing him various different specimens of things, probably because he was going to pay them, uh, pay, uh, he's going to pay for them. In fact, the one guy over here on the right, if you look, you can see or there's Darwin in the middle there and with a collection of bones and rocks and skulls and things next to him. This guy over here says uh, he's got a hat full of seashells and he's saying, the least I can get for these is a tot, <laughs> meaning a tot of rum, <laughs> thinking that, well, you know, I don't know what this guy wants exactly, but at least I can get drunk off it. And then over here, this guy is uh, saying, I've killed a fine specimen of a flying monkey 
shot three specimens of geese and was very near being yaffled by a damned big bear. And sure enough, he's holding a flying monkey. Uh, and uh, there's a, a little dog or maybe a cat, probably a dog if they're ready to, ready to take a little share of this mythical beast that he's got. Now, this was actually drawn before Darwin reached the Falklands, but very shortly after this was drawn, when he got to the Falklands, he met an animal that had been called a flying monkey by whalers and sealers before that time. And these were striated caracaras. And Darwin was as struck by them as I was. He, put, he devoted more ink to them in the voyage of the beagle than he did to any other bird, in fact. And they, the thing that really struck him about them was their behavior. They, uh, they stole things from the crew of the beagle. They took hats. They took these, um, uh, these sort of bolas that were used for subduing cattle in the, in the, in the Falklands. And uh, my favorite object that he listed was a small cater's compass in a red Morocco leather case, which was never recovered. Now, what these birds were doing with these items, why they wanted them, he didn't know, but he was surprised that he had not seen them anywhere else. And he said that, you know, these birds doubtless for some good reason have chosen these islands as their metropolis, but he never figured out what that reason was. And this was sort of the MacGuffin of the book for me. It's just, I, I decided that, well, I'm gonna try to figure out why these birds were only in the Falklands and in a few islands off Tierra del Fuego, what they were, and why on earth they were like this, why they were so bold, so curious, and so funny. And he calls them tame and mischievous, quarrelsome and passionate, and they're still very much like this. But as it turned out, uh, the Falklands are just about the only part of the entire new world that Europeans actually discovered. And that the animals were so tame, not just the caracaras, but other animals that lived there, which really surprised him, was a function of the fact that they were in the very earliest days of their encounters with human beings, unlike most other animals on land on earth for whom these encounters had receded into the deep past. So uh, his record of seeing them and wondering about them is this record of uh, this very intelligent uh, and unusual bird of prey uh, meeting our species. So yeah. the, the, the book is sort of trying to trying to answer Darwin's question of like, what are they, why are they here and why are they only here? And I found it wonderful that that question kind of sat around since Darwin till, till you, you of all people decided to, to pick <laughs> it up. And it, yeah, I, was, I wasn't qualified. Hard. I was just the one that there was. It takes you down this rabbit hole that is so much deeper than anybody could possibly expect and requires you to do this um, um, amount of research that leads you in these these crazy directions but essentially you end up having to tackle the question of consciousness and yeah. what what it means to have uh, a higher intelligence at, at one point you uh you write uh of the of the strided caracara calling them odd birds of prey feels like calling the painters of the italian renaissance a group of unusually gifted apes. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, that wakes the reader right up. Uh, well, birds you go on to prove that quite well, I have to say. Well, well birds of prey aren't known for their braininess. Um, the, and so let, I'll just show you a picture of a striated caracara here. Here's South America and here's the Falkland Islands way down here at the Southern tip. And here's the Jason Islands, which are up in the Northwest corner. And this is Steeple Jason. So this is what it looks like out there. And there's some Gen 2 penguins who are just coming ashore. And here's a striated, young striated caracara zooming in to check out what's going on. There's some more striated caracaras just hanging around. And what they do is they live off these uh, seabird populations that live on this island. There are hundreds of thousands of albatrosses, then many thousands of penguins, and also small burrowing seabirds called petrels. Uh, and there's a lot of chicks and eggs for them to eat in the summertime there. And here's one. And you can see how this sort of combination of a hawk and a crow description, it sort of fits. Um, what they are actually is a type of falcon. Uh, the falcon family is a, is a group of birds that we normally think of when you think of like a peregrine falcon or a kestrel, these, these fast, powerful hunters that are kind of single-minded in their pursuit of uh, winged, mostly winged prey. Um, but the caracaras are also part of this lineage. And what I think happened is that the book makes clear eventually is that um, the ancestors of the falcons came up from a warm Antarctica and entered South America 
where the greatest diversity of them is still found. And then a small sort of offshoot of them made its way into the Northern world and diversified fairly recently, you know, in evolutionary terms into the more familiar falcons that all of us who live in the Northern world know today. Um, but in South America, the earlier diverging lineages of them are still survive, including the Caracaras. And what's really, the, the, you know, I can't answer this question in a definitive way, but I, I wonder if the, the falcons that came north that are called the so-called true falcons uh, kind of gave up this part of their minds as they became these peerless hunters. Whereas in the South, they've been able to retain them. So this, this kind of uh, their curiosity, their uh, sort of generalist tendencies um, might be ancestral. Like that might be what, what looks to us like intelligence and acts to us like intelligence or what we call intelligence um, might be an older trait in some ways. Now here's uh, a striated caracara standing on an albatross nest on steeplejacent in the winter all these sort of tire shaped uh, structures are nests built by albatrosses, which look like giant seagulls. Like you imagine a, a sort of a, a gull like bird that, with an eight foot wingspan. That's what these are, they're black bar out albatrosses. But in the winter time, all these seabirds are gone. They can go to sea, they can drink salt water, uh, they can feed on, at, on, at sea. They don't need to come to land except to breed. So the uh, striated caracaras can't do that. They can't drink salt water, they can't swim, they're just stuck there. And so they have to feed on anything they can find, anything the sea coughs up, anything unusual, uh, they're right into it, whatever it is. And so they've, over time, I think this has exaggerated their fondness for anything new in their environment, which if you visit them includes you. And so like, you know, I've been uh, walking along the shore on this island and you look down and you see like this, you'll see your shadow and then this big winged shadow comes up and kind of merges with it. And if you look up, there's a striated caracara hovering over you about a foot or two above your head with its feet dangling. And it's, it's not trying to make a meal out of you. It, they're just interested. And they'll even drop and sort of bonk you on the head and zoom off like it's like they're trying to play tag. And even after I've caught them and you know put, put bands on their legs and weighed them for studies, uh, they'll sometimes, you do have to do things like put them inside a bag to weigh them. You'll let them go and they'll just turn around and sort of shake off and then they'll turn around and walk back towards you just staring at you like, what are you? It's, they're just overwhelmed by this instinct and it's, um, you know, it, it's just captivating. Yeah, and it's a, this nature, this curiosity that to us seems so human or this thing that we recognize in us. And it's something I've been thinking a lot of, about with my work with, with Medi, which is more or less a, a think tank about um, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps messaging extraterrestrial intelligence or, or ontological implications of first contact situations. And, and the question of is, is curiosity a universal thing amongst higher intelligence, or is it a merely one facet of what we re refer to when we talk about the qualities that make up something we think of as higher intelligence? Yeah, it, the, in a way, higher and lower is sort of a strange way to talk yes. about intelligence because um, you know a tree has its own kind of intelligence. The we just always mean something that's like us, right? When we use that word, for the most part, it's been wonderful to see things like like when we were talking earlier, you mentioned the film, My Octopus Teacher, like the, the thought of these other minds that uh, in manifest qualities we think of as like the kind of intelligence that we have, even though an octopus's brain is constructed very differently from ours. And in the case of birds, when you're looking at, uh, the last time that we had a common ancestor with a bird was about 300 million years ago. We were amniotes, we were sort of uh, amphibious creatures that lived in swamps and laid eggs. And since that time, we've been on separate evolutionary journeys. So really, when you add it up, we've got 600 million years of evolutionary time between us and birds. And yet, we're able to look across this gap towards each other. And in, in one of the chapters of the book, I talk about captive striated caracaras that live in England. And uh, this is still in the Falklands. This is a, a Falkland Islander named Lorraine McGill with some uh, striated caracara friends. But this bird, Tina, 
and her keeper there, Jeff, who's a falconer, live in Devon in England. And Tina and Jeff forged this unusual friendship that was really striking. Jeff had worked with birds of prey for many years. He had never met a bird like Tina. Mostly birds of prey are not that interested in being your friend. They want food uh, or they want to rest. Uh, they can't be induced to do things like fly to a glove, anything if they're not hungry. Uh, and Tina, when Jeff tried to train Tina, uh, wouldn't obey any of falconry's conventions. Um, she wouldn't use Jess's in a hood. She hated it. She just was completely intractable and finally kind of gave up and let her do what she wanted. And to his astonishment, she started to play games with him. He went into her aviary one morning and he dropped his keys while he was cleaning the aviary and she jumped down picked them up off the ground. Karakaras love to run and walk. Uh, she just picked them up in her beak and ran to the other side of the aviary and stood there staring at him. And he thought, he'd never seen a bird do anything like this. He thought, this is a game. She's trying to play a game with me. And that was what she did. She played keep away and eventually traded the, the keys for a, a piece of food. And from then on, this was how every morning began. And Jeff became so interested in Tina that he created a set of devices to try to test her color perception and her ability to differentiate shapes. And uh, eventually in flying demonstrations, he could put out a set of colored balls and ask an audience to, to which color he'd like her to pick up. And uh, they'd say, you know, blue, and Tina would jump down, go pick up a blue ball and come back with it. He could even throw a set of stuffed animals over his shoulder and say, go get Miss Piggy. And she would jump down, pick up Miss Piggy, run back and drop it in a bucket. You'd be waiting forever to see an eagle or a hawk do this. They would never do it. So here you've got this strange, that uh, Tina would call for him when he, wouldn't come, when, he, when he didn't appear on time. She would fall asleep on his shoulder. They were friends. And yet this isn't a domesticated animal. You know, there aren't centuries of, of, uh, of, of domestication, of interrelation, of the kinds of interactions that we associate with like, dogs or, or other animals that we've brought in close to us. Uh, she was, her, her parents were taken in from the wild. And so that these two organisms here, we got our human and this bird, this striated caracara, were able to be friends across a 600 million year gap of evolutionary time. Does make it seem like it might be possible somehow uh, for if we met some other form of life out there in the cosmos, that it's not impossible that we might be able to communicate with one another. Yeah, and that's one of the big revelations of the book. Uh, the big, the big takeaways for me was, you you wrote something like how 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 a mind very much like our own can be formed from completely different materials and by completely different means. Yeah, and I mean we're both vertebrates, obviously, and we have we have uh, I mean, all life shares a common ancestry, but we have. Um, a pronounced common ancestry, but at the same time, like the avian forebrain or the sort of analogous structure to our forebrains, which we think of as our seat of self and other and uh, memory and, and um, be the ability to project ourselves forward and backward in time. Birds have this, but the structure evolves out of a different structure in, our, in their brains than ours does. So they've created their own forebrain that performs many of these same functions. And that's a, it's a convergence. And uh, one thing that's really interesting about falcons is that recently uh, DNA research revealed that falcons are not as closely related to hawks and eagles and owls and other birds of prey as they are to parrots. Their nearest ancestor is parrot. So there's a common parrot falcon ancestor. And you can sort of see more of a parrot, what seems like a parody kind of mind or intelligence in these caracaras, um, especially in the, in the the striatids, but really in all of them. And as, as, the, as I kept on looking at these birds, I started to become curious about their relatives because they're not the only species of caracara. There are actually 10, all of which live in South America, except for one which is in South America, but it also ranges northward uh, and actually comes up as far as, as here. The most recent, uh, the first one ever seen in New York state turned up about four years ago. And it was actually, it's a, a very similar to this bird. This is called a crested caracara uh, or in Southern, uh, Southern South America, they're called carancho. And South America, interestingly, has no large crows. There are no big black crows. There's no ravens. 
There's a few tropical jays, which are crow relatives, but there's, there's nothing like the kind of crows that are in the Northern world and in Australasia. Uh, instead, it's like they have these kind of crow-like birds, like I said, built on a falcon chassis. And this is one of them. They're sort of more, they're like ravens, but, but falcony ravens. There's a pair of them in the Falklands in a, in a tree, which is unusual because there are no trees in the Falklands that weren't planted by people. Um, the, uh, the, that's one of the things I really like about the book is that it, it almost gets metaphysical, <laughs> and particularly in your recognition of something, just this gut feeling that you have throughout the book that there's something familiar in these, in these birds. Was there, a, was there any particular moment when you found yourself stopped dead in your tracks and, and almost spooked at what you were seeing? Constantly. Um, Any time that I've been able to spend with caracaras, I'm always amazed and, and often amused by what they do. They just seem so conscious uh, and so aware of their surroundings and, and flexible in how they approach it. I mean, I remember a, a, a striated caracara that I was watching in the Falklands that um, this, by the way, that you're looking at is a, a small relative of theirs called a Chimango caracara, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a minute. But uh, it was approaching a trap, which was a piece of meat with some snares attached to it. And two other adult birds had decided that this trap, this meat was theirs, and they were going to guard it against all comers. Well, this third bird came in, and it was also an adult bird, so at least five years old by its plumage. And first, it kind of zoomed in and tried to take some of the meat, but the other birds weren't having that. They just saw it off. But then it kind of it came back around, and it landed, and it, it suddenly hunched over, adopted this posture that young fledglings use when they're begging for food from their parents. And it started making the same call that very young birds do when they're begging for food. It was like, oh, 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 oh. like I'm a little bitty baby. You, I don't, you don't need to hurt me. I just want food. And it was just like, I was just stunned looking at this, like, is this going to work? And it walked towards these other birds and they let it get closer. They didn't let it get to the meat though. So after a lot of a while of kind of like hunching around and going, it flew up to a little stone wall, sat there for a minute and then it kind of straightened up. And then it sort of looked around and went, ah, 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 which is the call that means, hey everybody, there's food. And suddenly, all these striated character has descended out of the hills and they all mobbed the trap, which totally overwhelmed the pair that was trying to guard it. And then it became a free for all with everybody trying to grab meat. And it was, it was just watching this bird go through these different strategies to try to manipulate the other birds and see how much food it could get out of, you know, could it do it by itself? Could it sort of beg its way in somehow? And then finally, all right, well, then we'll just have a scrum and we'll just see who can, who can get whatever they can. Uh, that was that was staggering to watch because that all took about five minutes to happen, and because they're they're still as Darwin saw them, they're still so unconcerned by your presence. Um, you don't have to be watching at a distance with a scope; you can be sitting right there when this happens, and that was uh, astonishing. Yeah, you draw this really f strong line uh, in the natural world between the specialists and the generalists. And the specialists, for instance, the peregrine falcon which is an excellent hunter, has one prey, completely focused, does one thing very yeah. well, and is kind of dumb. <laughs> and then you have- In its way, yeah. It's, in yeah. its way. And, and then you have the generalists, which are the striated caracara that, you know, that is, you said- or crows or- Many interests and few skills <laughs> which is, yeah. you know that that's that's us you yeah. know that you know the famous joke you know what's the it's what's the last words of a redneck he's watch this <laughs> <laughs> you know in the falklands they're called johnny rooks which is another old nickname from the whaling days and it, it really suits them a lot better than striated caracara which is a mouthful uh, this this little bird here that we're looking at the chimango caracara is common throughout southern south america so common that people hardly even notice it. Um, there's a saying in Argentina, no gastes polvora en chimango, which means uh, don't waste your ammunition on a cara cara, on a, on a chimango. They're just useless little things. Well, they're kind of like winged jackals. And 
this guy, uh, William Henry Hudson, who's kind of the really the hero of this book, was uh, born in Argentina in the Pampas in that broad grassy plain that, that's south of, south of Buenos Aires. He was born there in the 1840s, about 10 years after Darwin passed through there. And uh, he grew up loving the wildlife of this region. And when he was about 27 years old after his parents died, he, he immigrated to England and never returned. But he spent most of the rest of his life writing um, about the wildlife and landscapes of England and the wildlife and landscapes of La Plata, of the place that he grew up. And he said about Chimango Caracaras, he said, um, the, a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have had a whole volume to itself in England. Being only a poor foreigner, it has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. And this is part of the problem is that even Darwin called them false eagles who ill become so high a rank. They just rankled the, uh, the, uh, the they, they they didn't fit the definition of what a bird of prey was, a self-respecting bird of prey was supposed to be. And, but Hudson thought that these birds were incredibly smart and they were very, very good at learning, not just from each other, but from other species. And I mean, I talk about this some in the book, There's a, there are some Argentine researchers who uh, recently did experiments with this species where they took a group of them and showed them how to open, or, and showed them a series of plexiglass boxes that had food inside. And, they left them to try to figure out how to open them while they had another group that was watching them. Well, the birds that uh, opened the boxes and got the food, I mean, they did pretty well. Most of them managed to do it, but the birds that were watching them while they did it had an even higher success rate. And this is sort of what you see just on any given day with them. You'll see them tearing open pizza boxes and getting into plastic bags and you know all the, the panoply of objects that we bring with us, which are so bewildering and, and and multifarious and always changing, but they're able to adapt to them and figure out how to make use of them and how to make use of the landscape as we transform it. And uh, I get into this later, but I think that's part of why the caracaras have survived when so many other animals that once lived in South America have died out. Well, the, the chimango actually fits into our first question from Diane Williams. Do these birds live only in the Falklands or maybe also in other parts of South America. So well, maybe you could talk about the difference between the Chimango and, and the Caracara, the, the regions. And also, if you wouldn't mind, tell us how there, we ended up with so many in captivity in England. <laughs> um, there's an entire chapter about that, about why, why there are captive striated Caracaras in England called um, In the Court of the Penguin King, because it all stems from the, uh, the adventures and misadventures of, this, of a guy named Len Hill, who started a bird park in England in the, in the 1960s, I think it was when it opened, called Birdland. And he ended up, to make a long story short, he ended up importing striated caracaras from the Falklands. And as far as I know, all the, the birds that live in, the, in England now are descended from birds that Len Hill imported. Uh, but there are a lot of them. Uh, there are at least 60 that I know of and probably more. Um, but as, as far as are there relatives, this is exactly the question that I had after meeting them in the Falklands. I think, are there more of these? And the answer is yes, there are other species, but the number of striated caracaras is probably about the same as the number of giant pandas. It's probably around 3000 adult individuals. Now on the South American mainland, there are nine other species of caracaras, all of which are, are different, but they all have this same caracara-ness about them. They're all very clever, inquisitive, um, uh, a Jesuit in the 16th century wrote that uh, all manner of, of uh, is it this, all manner of living is known to this bird. Um, it, it pries into, understands, and take, takes advantage of everything. Now, this is one that lives up in the Andes, really far from the Falklands, even though it's actually the striated's closest relative. It's called a carunculated caracara, and it's featured in. Uh, Andean legends and traditions in much the same way that say ravens do in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, here, this is the, uh, the uh, Chilean part of the Altiplano, which is a the sort of giant central plateau in the middle of the Andes that makes them look sort of like, if you look, the Andes are the longest chain of mountains on earth, but if you look at them, they, they look sort of like a snake that swallowed an egg. And this big central swelling is the Altiplano. It's the largest, um, highest and driest plateau on earth outside Tibet. And this is where you find um, the mountain caracaras, which I'll show you in a second. This is a, a person dressed as a, as a caracara called a curiquingue. 
which is that carunculated caracara who uh, parades in the, in the Andean highlands often feature people costumed uh, as these birds and they're seen as tokens of, of good luck and good fortune. There's a mountain caracara there standing on the ruins of Machu Picchu. And here is uh, one of the last Inca emperors, Huascar, wearing the feathers of a mountain caracara uh, in what's called the mascapaicha, the, the, the ceremonial crown that the Inca emperors wore. And only Inca emperors were permitted to wear the feathers of these birds. There's one uh, last year at a high rise in La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, people were all shut in and the people who lived in an apartment in this uh, tower building started feeding a mountain caracara that came to their window. And it brought two more mountain caracaras with it and they set up a nest and they started breeding. Now a, a, three, a, a three adult group is a little unusual, but not entirely for caracaras that it seems like they have a sort of propensity for uh, unusual or unconventional family arrangements. Um, sometimes they form pairs as adults, but sometimes they're groups of three or four. And in the case of the red-throated caracaras, which are a tropical species, which we'll get to in a second, um, these groups can be even larger. It's almost like a tribe. There'll be multiple males, multiple females, all in one territorial unit that tends one nest together, seems to raise one chick at a time and defends a territory with elaborate displays of screaming and, and sort of dancing um, that they're just, the, they're, they might be the strangest falcons on earth. They live, uh, to go see them, I went to Guyana, which is on the Northeast coast of South America, sort of, there's, there's three countries, Guyana, Suriname and French Guyana, which kind of there in the shoulder of South America between Venezuela and Brazil. And they're often neglected when people talk about South America because they're not really part of Latin America. Um, the official language spoken in Guyana is English. In Suriname, it's Dutch. In French Guiana, it's French. In fact, French Guiana is still politically considered part of France. They use the Euro. You can actually cross a remote range of mountains in Northern Brazil and uh, enter the Eurozone. But this area also has a very, very large tract of um, relatively undisturbed tropical forest that's never been logged that has very few people in it and uh, very few roads. And I went there with um, three Amerindian men from Southern Guyana and a Canadian researcher named Sean McCann who'd been studying red-throated caracaras uh, to see if we could find them up in there. This is uh, Josie George, Rambo Roberts uh, with a young black caiman there and then Brian Duncan. And we went up this river in Guyana called the Rewa, you can see in the inset there, uh, that goes into one of the most remote and beautiful forests in, in all of South America, where you can find uh, but we, uh, carvings uh, on, in the river uh, left by people who were there a long time ago. Uh, could be many thousands of years ago, could just be hundreds of years ago, but these are the marks of people who've been sharpening stone tools. And our other companion, the Canadian researcher was uh, uh, Sean McCann, who I'm going to show you a picture of, but I should give you an uh, arachnophobia trigger warning. Uh, so if you're skeeved by spiders, um, you might want to close your eyes for a minute. This is Sean, uh, and he's wearing as an ornament the largest spider in the world. This is Therophosa blondi, a goliath bird eater. It's a specialty of that region. And uh, Sean loves spiders, so this is Sean in hog heaven. But uh, this, is, this episode is described in the book about you have to understand, or you have to read the book to learn why on earth he's, he's wearing one as a, as a sort of piece of costume jewelry there. But this is a red-throated caracara. And the thing about red-throated caracaras, besides their interesting family life, is that their diet seems to consist of mostly wasps' nests, which is a food that few other animals in the forest attempt to eat for pretty obvious reasons. If you've ever tried to get rid of a nest of yellow jackets or had... Uh, paper wasps building a nest in the eaves of your house. Um, wasps like to defend their homes. And there's always a mystery that's clung to these birds about how are they able to do this without just getting murdered? And there was a speculation that they produced some kind of wasp repellent. So Sean's PhD research consisted of going into the forest in French Guiana, trying to charge with the mission of figuring out whether red-throated caracaras secreted a wasp repellent or not. I'm not going to tell you what he found because you have to read the book to find out. It's an amazing answer, but uh, this was his this was his goal. Here's some of them 
uh, doing a doing part of their war dance. They're really unhappy if they, they see you. Um, they let you know in no uncertain terms that this is their place, that you don't belong here and that you had better get out. But they have this sort of, they have the same cara cara intensity and, and sort of manifest intelligence and curiosity as all the other species do. Uh, but they're very, very special, these birds. Here's a young red-throated caracara on a nest. Sean was the first person to photograph a nest of red-throated caracaras. And this is in a bromeliad, um, which is a, an epiphytic plant that lives in a tree far up above the forest uh, floor. This one's almost 200 feet up. To get up to it, Sean had to use a, a crossbow and fire a bolt over a high branch and then get in climbing gear and, and hoist himself up the tree wearing a helmet while the adults sort of attacked him. And this young bird you can see has some bits of wasp comb there that the adults have brought it. And they've also brought it a millipede. In fact, there were a lot of millipedes in this nest, all dead. But Sean put a camera on the nest to see what was going on here. And the adults often brought these millipedes in. But uh, curiously, the young birds never ate them. The adults would hold them up to the young bird, sort of like, here, take a look at this thing, and then bite the head of the millipede and drop it into the bottom of the nest. Now, Sean hasn't done the work that would be required yet to, to prove why they're doing this, but one suspicion is that they're actually using it as a kind of chemical technology because millipedes have survived for almost 400 million years by secreting, uh, basically by being really bad tasting. They have these glands called repugnatory glands that secrete this sort of noxious smelling stuff. And some uh, monkeys in South America and actually lemurs in Madagascar anoint themselves with millipedes They'll pick them up and rub them all over their bodies, sometimes biting them first to get them kind of agitated, to rub these secretions on themselves. And lemurs actually seem to get kind of high from doing this. They'll just sort of, they'll kind of bliss out and have a sleep after doing it. But the thought is that there may be some kind of um, deterrent effect to skin parasites like ticks and mosquitoes. So uh, you may have a, an example of a, a sort of tribal bird using a chemical weapon here. And if that doesn't get you excited, um, I don't know. I, I, I guess you should probably leave the conversation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another, <laughs> and another thing. Here's, uh, this is a, a young yellow-headed caracara, another tropical species. And they have this funny uh, mutualism with these animals. This is a tapir. Um, it's, a, it's a little funny to see it head on like this. So it's hard almost to tell what it is. This tapir is fine. It's not dead. Uh, there, if you saw 2001, if you remember at the beginning of it, the, the apes are walking around and there's some strange sort of pig-like animals with a little trunk walking around. That's what a tapir is. Uh, they're uh, very unusual animals. They live in South America and in Southeast Asia because they used to be in North America and they died out there. But uh, tapirs get a lot of ticks and other parasites on their bellies as they walk around in the forest. And caracaras like to eat them. So they, if a tapir has sort of gone down to the river to drink uh, and a caracara comes around, the tapirs will actually roll over on their backs like a dog wanting to be petted. And the caracaras will walk all over them and, and eat the ticks off of them. And caracaras, of, the yellow-headed caracaras have also learned to do this with livestock. So you can find a lot of pictures of these things sitting on top of uh, cows uh, and uh, especially on top of capybaras, they especially love to do that. And it's just wonderful to see a bird of prey sitting on a rodent that's the size of a, you know, a German shepherd. It just kind of inverts the usual raptor rodent interaction in a wonderful way. That's a black caracara, another tropical species um, that is a little shyer. They, they sort of stay along wilder parts of tropical rivers. And uh, I always think of them like an animal that the, the Adams family might've kept as a pet. They've got this nice little widow's peak and they love to eat all kinds of ghastly things. And here's an adult who's trying to figure out how he's gonna get some food away from this black vulture who's eating this pile of fish guts. And after a while, this one was just kept looking at the vulture and looking at it. And finally it just charged at the vulture and the vulture kind of stepped back surprised and the caracara grabbed a handful of fish guts in one foot and then it hopped away on the other one like this. <laughs> it was such a caracara move. It's clever, it's funny, it's kind of charming, and it works. I'm sorry, Emerson, I've just been babbling at this point. Sorry. Right. Yeah. 
It's all right. I, I did want to relate this at, at least a little bit to, um, well, actually, let me go on here for just a minute and then we'll, we'll come sure. back to this. Um, this caracara is extinct called the Guadalupe caracara and you can learn all about it and uh, about that mysterious skull, human skull in the cabinet behind it in the book. This is a Northern crested caracara and this picture, this is a wild bird. This was taken about 45 miles east of Seattle, Washington, a place called Skykomish. These birds uh, used to be in North America during the Pleistocene. They're in the La Brea tar pits alongside the remains of ground sloths and um, uh, dwarf antelope and dire wolves and things. But they seem to be moving back north again now. They're seen more and more often throughout uh, the United States. They've even been seen in Canada. One of them hung around for a couple of years in Nova Scotia. Uh, they, they seem to be reoccupying uh, the northern New World. And I think they're doing this in part because um, they're following black vultures around, which are also moving north. Uh, and the thing is that there's a, there's a new predator in the United States uh, within the last century or so that uh, rivals anything that the, uh, the Pleistocene ever could have produced, the saber-toothed cats and the um, short-faced bears, dire wolves, all these kinds of things, which is called cars. Every year, cars kill as many deer in the United States on highways as there are wildebeest in the Serengeti. And that's not including anything about the, the squirrels, coyotes, rabbits, raccoons, possums, all the things you see dead on the side of the road. So we're creating these giant bird feeders for scavenging birds. And I think even though that you know our species has exploded in our, our range and our impact on the landscape in the last century, wildlife having taken a step back is now kind of starting to take a step forward in some ways, in some cases. And the crested caracara is maybe part of that. That's Lynn Hill who brought the striated caracaras into England. And this is a, 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 another unusual falcon from South America called a cryptic forest falcon. And I only include it because this species was described to science in 2003. That's how unknown uh, much of this place is, that something as big and flashy as a bird of prey um, is still not, is, I mean, all we know about it is that it exists. We don't know anything else about it at all. I'm gonna let you wonder about that picture. Okay. <laughs> Anson, I'll, I'll, yield the, I'll yield the controls back over to you. Sure. Um, I'll jump to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's from Mark Newton. Birds obviously have a special place in Shearwater songs, but how <laughs> have uh, Caracara's influenced your writing and did writing this book inspire anything in your upcoming album? <laughs> um, only in the most kind of indirect way. I mean, I, I think thinking about birds, thinking about the natural world and, th and um, doing, making music are both ways to get out of your own head, which is an experience that I crave more and more. I feel like the older that I get. Um, the direct relationship between them is hard to say. Uh, somebody said, well, you never, nobody ever asks Brian May um, about how astrophysics affects the music of Queen. But then the other night we was having a conversation with David Sibley and Margaret Atwood and she said, uh, she said, well, why doesn't someone ask him that question? That's a great question. And I thought, yeah, actually, it is a great question. We should definitely ask Brian May how astrophysics affects the music of Queen. But he also <laughs> might not be able to tell you. <laughs> well, another one from uh, same, the same uh, viewer, Mark, Mark Newton. I love this question. If Darwin was so effusive about caracaras, why do you think the Galapagos tortoises get all the limelight? <laughs> <laughs> It's a really good question. I wondered about it because the, the caracaras seem to kind of repel attention in a funny way. Some of it, I think, is this that, that they just wouldn't, they just won't behave like a, like a good bird of prey is supposed to in the sort of European ideal, you know, in which, you know, birds of prey are always emblems of rectitude, you know, kind of like, like Sam the Eagle in the Muppets, you know, who's always just looking down his beak at the, all the other characters. And caracaras are uh, much scrappier and, and, uh, and more enthusiastic than that about their approach to life. Um, I, 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 it's hard to say. I mean, the Galapagos offered Darwin a really clear example of how um, even just among a different a group of very close, uh, you know, a group of islands that were very close together, 
um, how life could, could move in different paths, uh, even on, on islands that you could see from one another. But the same was also true in the Falklands and he went to the Falklands first. So I think the Falklands kind of informed his thinking as he was heading north up the, up the west coast of South America. And in fact, uh, he even thought he had discovered a new species of caracara in the Galapagos, which later um, was revealed to be a type of hawk. But the reason that he thought it was a caracara was because it behaved kind of like the striated caracaras did. Um, they were very tame. They sort of gathered around just staring at him. Um, and I've, I've seen those birds. They're called Galapagos hawks. And you can still catch them as Darwin did by, um, by pushing them off a branch with a stick. But that's more, that's, uh, that's more an artifact of the way that, that wildlife regarded people. Um, or the, 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 I say wildlife, I just mean that other animals, our fellow animals, regarded us when they had never met us before. And you have to remember that when the first people to enter the Americas, um, the ancestors of, of Amerindian people came over the Bering Strait, they entered a continent, they entered two continents that had never seen anything like us. And so for thousands of years, this was the world they lived in. Now you can only see it in places like the Falklands or the Galapagos, but this was normal for a very long time. And it would have been an extraordinary place. Um, Stephanie Nelson uh, asked a question I wanted to read because I know that the answer is going to be very entertaining. Um, I'm surprised that caracaras are not used more in falcon falconry. Uh, why, why do you think caracaras have not caught on in falconry well <laughs> definitely they have but not for the reasons you'd expect <laughs> you want to explain why jonathan what what do you you're talking about the the flying demonstrations and the yeah um it, well i mean they're they're they don't do normal bird of prey stuff exactly that but if you uh, if you look online for uh caracaras and falconry you'll find all kinds of really fascinating and funny examples of them doing things like knocking over trash cans and walking through pipes um, and the, like the stunt with the, uh, the stuffed animals that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think there's a, there's a growing knowledge among falconers that caracaras are in fact very special and very interesting. Uh, but it's a, falconry is a funny thing. It's, it's you know, falconers aren't ornithologists. Um, they're not behavioral scientists. They know the birds as individuals, um, but they know, don't always, this isn't true for all of them. In fact, I think this is really changing, but, but historically it wasn't so much important like where a bird came from or what its natural habitat was. It was what was more important was the bird's tendencies and behaviors. And for the true falcons, especially, um, they were very predictable. They were kind of rote, like you had to take a falcon um, or a hawk. Uh, well, if, if, if any of you have read H's for Hawk uh, by Helen MacDonald in which she trains a goshawk a type of, a type of hawk, um, she has to take it through a process called manning. That's uh, kind of like breaking a horse. Like you have to, you have to basically convince the hawk that it to accept you as an inevitable fact of its life because it doesn't want to. And um, caracaras aren't like that. Um, they'll accept you as a sort of member of their social group or or not uh, right away. And they seem to crave this kind of social interaction. They'll do things. They'll they'll quote unquote perform. Uh, they'll, they want to be active. They want to be interested in um, new items. They want new tricks to do or new, new activities to explore. Um, and uh, they don't like to do the same things too often. They get bored. So for falconers with it, with a, a taste for, for something um, very different from the, the traditions of falconry, uh, caracaras offer a very interesting uh, opportunity. Um, Jonathan Cade asks, is there any upside to ecotourism? Would Falklanders be more willing to celebrate and give space to the Johnny Rooks if tourists were going there to see them? Or would that further destabilize things? Um, yes, I mean, th this, this has actually changed in the last sort of generation. I mean, in the, in the Falklands Strait, Caracaras were persecuted by sheep farmers for a long time, especially around the turn of the 20th century when the, the government of the islands actually put a bounty on their beaks and, and they were nearly wiped out. Um, now they're becoming as much of a, a sort of known feature and attraction of the, of the wildlife there as the seals and the, the penguins and the albatrosses that people who visit them on, on cruise ships and things see. And on uh, some islands, there are even islands where they were uh, 
uh, people who are not given to a good opinion of them have completely changed their minds um, and now celebrate them. So I think their, their future in the Falklands uh, where the people concerned is, is very bright. Um, the future of the Falklands themselves is a little more open to question because they're islands and they're not that tall. And that's, uh, that's sort of a, an inescapable liability in an, in an age when seas are, are going to rise and islands are gonna shrink. Um, Philip Troutman asks, and this may be our last question. Uh, he asks, um, sorry, uh, have caracaras been introduced to areas that they're not native to? And if so, what is the result? Uh, <laughs> they compete with, displace, or what effect do they have? And I picked this question, Jonathan, because you make a, you, you really dive right into this uh, in, in part of the book. And you talk about their propensity for, or their, their, their potential for, uh, for adaptability. Yeah, I mean, I, I suggested with tongue only partly in cheek that they might do really well in cities. And there was a, a one that escaped the London Zoo and went on the lamb in North London for two weeks and was seen, quote, ripping into a whole cooked chicken and, uh, and walking, walking down Kilburn High Street. And uh, when they got it back, they said he seemed none the worse for wear. But there is one place on earth where a Caracara species, one that I know of where a Caracara species was deliberately introduced. And that was Easter Island, oddly enough, where a Chimango Caracaras were introduced there. Uh, but Easter Island's very special because Easter Island had been really severely uh, uh, disrupted ecologically um, by people uh, long ago. And the Polynesian people who went there um, managed to, to cut down most of the forests and really kind of exhaust the, the resources that the, the island had available. And so it, it's even though it was once a forested place, now it's just sort of an open grassland. Uh, Chimangos were introduced there in the 1920s, I think with the idea that they might help to control mice or rats, but Chimangos aren't really very into that. Instead, they sort of settled into the same lives William Henry Hudson saw them um, pursuing in the, in the Pampas where they were just um, you know, stealing eggs from chickens and uh, the, the, the name for them in, in Easter Island in, in the, the, the local language of Rapa Nui is, uh, is Manu Toke Toke, which is thief birds, uh, but they seem to do really well there now but they're one of four species of land birds in Easter Island. Um, I'm just coming back on since that was our last question, but I think it's safe to say for everyone out there, we could maybe have a week long seminar on characters <laughs> and all these birds of prey. Um, so um, we really would like to thank both Jonathan Myberg, Anson Mount, and our audience out there for engaging with the discussion. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you these types of amazing events, and we simply couldn't do it without the book sales to support them. So go ahead and follow the link in the chat to get your copy of A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life, and Epic Journey of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey, or just visit us at politics-pros.com. And while you're there, don't hesitate to check out our events calendar and everything else we've got coming up. From our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well read. Look out the window, look at the birds, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Anson. It's really been a pleasure. Okay.